Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the sixth week debate here at the Oxford Union. The debates before the House tonight will be, this union would save the union. I would now like to ask to open the case for the proposition, the Treasurer-elect of the union, Viren Shetty. Viren, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Looking at the lineup tonight, I thought about what I could really add to this debate. I'm a 19-year-old British Indian from London. He's been to Scotland just once in his life. What do I have to add to this debate against MPs and political advisors who, hopefully, have a far better understanding of the debate than me? Well, I'm a historian, and the historian looks in me looks at this motion and thinks back to 1707 and the Acts of Union which united England and Scotland in the first place. Scotland and England, Scotland and England had been ruled by the same monarchs in 1603, when James VI of Scotland ruled as James I of England. This unification was an incredibly peaceful one. A medievalist would find it hard to believe that the country which had kept out the Romans and won the Battle of Bannockburn would later accept being ruled from London. However, full political unification came over a hundred years later. It was only in the context of European state building in the 17th and early 18th century that the advantages of being ruled as a single political and economic entity became clear. After Union, Scotland benefited from free trade with Britain and the colonies, but still retained control of a permanent Presbyterian church in Scotland and a separate system of laws and courts. This shows that devolution was not a Blairite invention or even a recent compromise, but an integral to the, acts, to the original Acts of Union. Scotland was not a colony of England and, in agreeing to the Union, had only given up its right to threaten England's military security and make commercial relations more complicated. The Acts of Union did therefore pave the way for a united Britain's industrial, economic and political success in the 19th century and meant both England and Scotland benefited from its great power status. Now my little nerdy history rants over. Taking this historical perspective leads me to my three main points as to why we should continue to support the Union today. Firstly, as then, now, Scotland and England benefit materially from being a single political entity. Free unrestricted trade, the pooling of resources and welfare provision, and avoiding a costly separation are all reasons why we should seek to preserve the Union today. Second, Union with England has brought and will continue to bring softer reputational benefits to Scotland. In a world where the West is struggling to maintain its relevance and Britain is continuing to isolate itself, Further dissolution is not the answer. Finally, I believe this union should support the union as Scotland itself showed its support for the union in 2014. Although this motion isn't asking whether we support another referendum, the fact that we had one less than seven years ago in what was promised to be a once in a generation vote ought to make us dismiss the independence question for the time being. Only by wholeheartedly committing ourselves to the union and respecting the choice of the people can we make governing this single country a success? Before I elaborate on these points, it falls upon me to introduce the opposition speakers tonight. First, we have Rachel Ojo, a first year PPEist from University College and an outstanding member of the Secretary's Committee. It really is no surprise that Rachel is speaking on the opposition tonight in favor of breaking up the union given her current attempt to disunite the librarian's uncontested slate in next week's election. <laughs> Let's hope she has a better chance of winning next week than she does tonight. Second, we welcome Mark Littlewood, Director General of the Libertarian Free Market Think Tank, the Institute of Economic Affairs. Having previously advocated for further European integration, Mark then turned Brexiteer and advocated voting leave in 2016. I presume he gained his ability to change his opinion from having studied PP at Balio. Let's hope I can persuade him to change his mind on tonight's issue before he speaks tonight. Third, we have Alan Smith, current member of Parliament for Stirling. He's also previously served as a member of the European Parliament for Scotland, a role which evidently no longer exists. If Alan gets his way, it will be the second role of his to be abolished. And so I'd be really interested to hear about any future career plans that he might have and avoid applying for such roles myself. Finally, we have Stephen Gethins, former MP for North East Fife. Having lost his seat 
in 2019, I'll be incredibly interested to find out what exactly one must do to actually lose to the Lib Dems. Although I doubt he'll be speaking much about that tonight. <laughs> Mr. President, these are your guests and they are most welcome. The most basic point in favour of the union is the fact that, in, that an independent Scotland would be poorer and weaker than if it were to be part of the United Kingdom. Scotland's economy would be far weaker independent. Scotland may have a population of 5 million, but as part of the United Kingdom, it has easy access to a market of over 60 million. Scotland sells more to the rest of the UK than to every other country in the world combined. The Scottish welfare system is also deeply integrated into that of the wider UK. The SNP do not have a credible and well-costed set of proposals for maintaining welfare provision after independence. It is rather ironic that a party which sits on the left is so willing to jeopardise the provision of welfare to the Scottish people and is unwilling to look at the evidence that Attlee relied upon our nation's political unity to set up an efficient welfare state in the first place. When it comes to defence, Scotland benefits from the UK's £40 billion defence and security budget. Today, the threats we face are less state-based and obvious. In dealing with issues such as terrorism and cybersecurity, Scotland reaps the rewards of a well-established intelligence network. Leaving the United Kingdom would, in reality, leave Scotland more vulnerable with a poorly funded young defence unit. The Scottish government, moreover, has not shown itself to be any more competent than the British government. The current crisis facing the SNP, the row between Salmond and Sturgeon, shows just this. Scotland continues to have the highest drug death rate in the EU. Students from south of the border are more likely to be offered a university space in Scotland than those from Scotland themselves. The gap in the Scottish employment rate and that of the UK, which is performing better, has reached, just reached two percentage points for the first time in nearly two decades. Leaving the United Kingdom would leave Scotland at the mercy of a party which is tearing itself apart. United only on the issue of independence and in no real position to make a su success of it. As per current arrangements, the British government can easily counteract faults and weaknesses in governance north of the border. After independence, Holyrood would have no such safety net. The Scottish people already benefit from local policy making as a result of devolution and can therefore continue to adopt tailored policies from within the union. The process itself of leaving the United Kingdom would leave Scotland in an incredibly weak position. Scotland is in no fit state to deal with the size of the deficit which would be attributed to it in the case of independence. This would also likely pre precipitate the devaluing of any new Scottish currency and tumble Scotland into economic crisis. At a time like now where the entire country, or more appropriately, the entire world is suffering from a crisis in the economy and in health, it surely isn't wise to cause further instability and push Scotland into further economic uncertainty. Scotland has, most strikingly, benefited from the British government's successful vaccine rollout and, homegrown innovative, and the homegrown innovative capacity of this very university. Leaving the United Kingdom would make Scotland a foreign country and cut up it off from supplies, which are very literally keeping it alive. My second point is that independence for Scotland would leave Scotland weaker politically on the world stage. Historically, Scotland both contributed to and benefited from Britain's greatness. The Indian in me would like to point out the large role played by Scotsmen in the East India Company and the importance of the cultural capital of being at the centre of the British Empire. My great grandmother went to a Scottish secondary school in the hill station of Uti in Tamil Nadu, where they ate haggis on burns night and commemorated St Andrew's Day. Today, Scotland continues to benefit from the British brand. Although Britain today is no longer a colonial power, it manages to hold on to a degree of status and prestige in international relations. While post Suez, many commentators thought that British political authority was waning and that we had been eclipsed after the Second World War by the USA, Britain continues to hold a high degree of authority. It still has a seat and a veto on the Security Council and is a member of the G7, and it still is the sixth largest economy in the world. Countries aspire to Britishness and British values, and the UK government is well adept at making use of this. It has a strong bargaining power when it comes to making bilateral treaties as it benefits from its illustrious history. In a world where developing nations such as China, India, and Brazil are slowly outgrowing the West, and Britain itself is playing a delicate and difficult game to maintain its authority, Scotland would far rather be part of a wider and stronger political authority. 
A typical argument of those who cry out for independence now is that Britain has shown that it doesn't care about its position on the world stage by voting for Brexit. It is argued that a majority of the Scottish people voted to remain in the EU, and there is pre precedent, therefore, for this part of the country to become independent. What these people neglect is the fact that there is no guarantee that Scotland would be let back into the EU. The Brexit negotiation itself took an incredible toll and a considerable, considerable amount of resources from both parties. In the current economic crisis, it is unlikely that the EU27 would be willing to re-accept part of a country which has just left. Moreover, as a smaller country with a population of just 5 million, Scotland has very little bargaining power left. Finally, I would argue that similar to how the 2016 referendum was a final vote on Brexit, the decisive 2014 independence referendum showed that there is not enough support for independence in Scotland itself to warrant a breakup of the union. Alex Salmond famously called the 2014 campaign a once in a generation vote. Seven years is clearly not enough time for a generation to have passed. The campaign itself was a costly and divisive one, and simply reframing the narrative around independence plagues the Scottish government with this perpetual nationalist question. We sometimes forget that what Scottish independence really is, is a nationalist question. The Scottish people in 2014 voted against nationalism and against breaking up the union. While some might argue that demographic shifts, Brexit and the pandemic now warrant us reconsidering this independence question, it is clear that breaking up the union would be an undemocratic and therefore dangerous manoeuvre. The acts of union were therefore paramount to the creation of a great power. While they were not democratically agreed upon and the people on either side of the border were not consulted, they did lead to Britain, Great Britain, the United Kingdom, becoming a 19th and 20th century superpower, for better or for worse. Today, Scotland continues to benefit from this union. It is stronger, richer and more powerful as part of the United Kingdom, and dissolving the union would only serve to plunge it into, deep, into a deeper sense of crisis, particularly at this turbulent time. Sitting here as members of this union, we ought to take into account the fact that our country has been and will continue to be stronger as one, as well as the fact that, that the Scottish people themselves voted decisively in 2014 and that, that the UK is better together. I see, therefore, there only being one option for us tonight, to support the union. Thank you. Baron, thank you very much for that. It's wonderful for once to have the roast be at someone else's expense and not at me in my extreme age. And now to open the case for the opposition, I'd like to ask Rachel Lojo of University College and to the Secretary's Committee. Rachel, thank you. Good evening, everyone. I would like to begin by thanking the President for the opportunity to speak in such an important debate. The issue of Scotland and its union with the rest of the United Kingdom is a controversial issue and one which has been debated for years. On the 18th of September 2014, the Scottish referendum took place and by a small amount, the people of Scotland chose to save the union. This must have come as a delight to then Prime Minister David Cameron as he wouldn't have his legacy be the man who lost Scotland. However, I'm sure he'll be remembered well enough for the other referendum he decided to hold. Yes, in 2014, there was a vote to save the union, but since then, so much has changed. Before I explain my arguments opposing the motion, it falls upon me to introduce the proposition speakers in tonight's debate. Opening the case for the proposition is Vera Shetty, a second year PPE student from Christchurch College and the union's very own treasurer elect. Now, with Vera's very long career in the union, what some could call an obsession, I have to say that I applaud his self-control in not following the temptation to make his speech about the Oxford Union. Next up, we'll have Sir Malcolm Rifkin, former Conservative MP for Edinburgh Petlands, who has served as Secretary of State for Scotland under Margaret Thatcher. After, we have Barney Stewart, former Labour MP for Birmingham Edmiston and the current life peer. She was also chair of the Vote Leave Campaign Committee. It seems she's quite selective when it comes to leaving unions. And, fi and finishing the case for the proposition, Doug Douglas Alexander, a former Scottish Labour Party MP who served as Secretary of State for Scotland under Tony Blair and was recently the chair of UNICEF UK. A former Conservative MP and two former Labour MPs, it's no surprise that they support the union. 
it's only a shame that Scotland doesn't quite feel the same way about their parties. My president, these, Mr. President, these are your speakers and they are of course most welcome. This debate on whether or not we should try and save the union could not have come at a more relevant time. Just this week, Boris Johnson addressed the United Kingdom explaining his plan for the future. The COVID pandemic has had a devastating effect on many aspects of all four parts of the union. And the words new normal have been thrown around a lot recently with no one quite being able to give an exact definition. And whilst I personally cannot gaze into the future and tell you exactly what the new normal will be like, there is one thing I can tell you for certain. And that is that change is inevitable. Not just change to how we live our lives, but change to the union. Independence will give Scotland the opportunity to take control and choose their own path in this time of rebuilding. They will be able to make progress on the issues that matter most to them, rather than having to follow the plans of Boris Johnson and his government, which the Scottish people did not want and who have repeatedly let down the Scottish people. Scotland should have a right to decide its own future. As much as we may try to resist change or may want to reminisce about the good old days, we need to face up to the facts. Not only is the case for Scottish independence a powerful one, Scottish independence is undeniably the best thing for the Scottish people and this house should not save the union. A free Scotland would be able to pursue its own cultural and social goals. It has become increasingly obvious that the views of Scottish people on many social issues differ greatly from the rest of the union. Economics is not the most important aspect in the case for Scottish independence. There are many more important as issues that motivate this case, such as identity. A recent survey conducted by the BBC proved that Scottish identity is not only very strong, but it is indeed stronger than British identity. Scottish people often feel that they are not prioritised when decisions are being made, and that is why they need to become independent. The free higher education policy votes at 16. These are just two key policy decisions that show that Scotland are leading the way in building a more progressive society, and one which they can feel proud of. Both of these changes would not have happened if the decision was based in Westminster, and therefore, Scotland is currently being held back from making more positive changes and becoming a positive example to the world. In the Brexit vote, Scotland voted overwhelmingly to remain in the EU. However, due to the fact that it was not independent, due to the fact that Scotland was shackled in this union, it was forced to leave the EU. With no clear plan or strategy in place, Scotland was dragged into a decision that arose from the lies and deception present in Westminster. In order to ensure a prosperous future, Scotland must take its future into its own hands and be able to decide on key issues without having to consult the rest of the UK. Scotland will not just survive, but it will thrive as an independent country. And that is why we should support its journey to independence. What I suppose the proposition will try to do today is feed us a lie about how Scotland would never survive economically without the union. This is simply not true. Scotland has 90% of the UK's fresh water, 96% of the UK's crude oil, and 70% of the UK's fishing landing. Now, whilst I do not claim to be a mathematician, it is clear to anyone that Scotland is rich in resources and will be able to prosper as an independent nation. Could it be perhaps that the reluctance of the government to have a second referendum is because not only do they know that Scottish independence will come into fruition, they also know that it will hurt and it will hurt them badly. Scotland has so many resources and so much of the UK's natural wealth that it's no surprise to me that there is an almost desperate struggle at Westminster to keep an already cracked union intact. I have no doubt that Scotland will be successful once it is independent, as it has a strong foundation to build upon. The population is highly skilled and it has universities that are recognized as outstanding worldwide. 
Although Scotland may be small, there are many other reasonably small European countries that are doing well and are a shining example of how successful and independent Scotland could be. In terms of Scotland's relationship with the UK, the UK would have no choice but to continue trading with Scotland. Currently around 60% of Scottish exports go to the UK. And the fact that Scotland is so geographically close with the rest of the UK means that this will always be an ideal arrangement for both parties. England will be keen to keep Scotland as an ally. And with the chains of the union released, Scotland would be free to fulfill the will of the Scottish people by rejoining the European Union. This opens up a world of opportunity and possibilities. By allowing increased trade with the European Union and all the perks associated with the EU that the rest of the UK will now be missing out on. As a country that voted for Brexit to take back our sovereignty, we need to understand that Scottish independence is the way for Scotland to restore their own sovereignty. So Scotland can act as an independent nation in its own right taking advantage of the bargaining power its dense levels of natural resources provided with in order to strike up new trading relationships across the globe. Either way, it is clear that this union is an anchor and that it is, struggling, that it is dragging Scotland down, a far cry from the powerful union of equals that was once envisaged. Thank you. Rachel, thank you very much indeed. I'm now going to ask uh, my uh, magic elves behind the scenes to pop up a poll to ask people now what they think about this debate um, going into it. Would the union save the union? That should be on everybody's screens right now. And whilst I give everybody just a second to vote, um, uh, all I'll say, Rachel, is that I think very interesting that David Cameron's great victory in the AV referendum didn't get a mention there either. I'm sure that's what he'll be remembered for in the fullness of time. Um, hopefully everybody has had a little minute now of my waffling to vote in this poll and we'll put that down now and I will ask Sir Malcolm Rifkind to continue the case for the proposition. Sir Malcolm, thank you. Well, Mr. President, thank you very much indeed. I've had the privilege of speaking uh, to the union at the union before. This is the first time I've done so in circumstances where I can't be heckled and I uh, therefore look forward to the next few minutes with undiluted pleasure. Uh, I congratulate the speaker who has just spoken, but I must correct her in one respect. Uh, she quite correctly pointed out that in the Brexit vote, uh, Scotland voted by, I think, 62% uh, to remain, and she implied this showed some deep north-south division. Uh, she should remember there was another major part of the United Kingdom that also, as it happens, voted 62% to remain, and that was London. Uh, so the one thing you cannot argue is that the different voting in different parts of the UK showed a north-south split. London and Scotland voted exactly the same way. Uh, so that is that particular argument, which I think is rather weaker than might otherwise have been uh, suggested. I want to go to the very heart of the, the argument from those uh, in the Nationalist Party uh, who want to break up the United uh, Kingdom. And I, I want to basically identify and point out three fundamental flaws in their argument. Uh, firstly, there is a fundamental flaw in the assumption, and it's more than an assumption, it's a claim, that the United Kingdom, the Union, formed in 1707, is essentially an artificial union, that it was some sort of historic mistake, which should never have happened. It was an accident of history, and now is the time to reverse it. It isn't very difficult to prove that that's complete nonsense. First of all, it so happens that Scotland, England, and Wales share the same island, that geographically, geologically, we are an item, a unit. And you know, it's interesting if you look around the world, this is not my main argument, but it's an interesting point. If you look around the, uh, the world, most of the big islands uh, are separate states and, and United States. They don't divide internally. The only two examples I can think of uh, where a large island has divided itself into more than one country, uh, they're not very good uh, examples from the point of view of the SNP. Haiti in the Dominican Republic and the Caribbean, Papua New Guinea and West Indian uh, in the, the Far East. Uh, I don't say that's the whole argument, but it shows that there are natural common interests. And linked to that is the fact that, of course, the English, the Scots, and the Welsh I always had, but since the Union increasingly, have an enormous amount in common. We share the same language. Uh, there is a Welsh and, Scot and Gaelic language. I'm very familiar with that. But 99% of the people of the United Kingdom, including the vast majority in Scotland and Wales, speak English as a first language. Uh, or as one of their major languages. Uh, so, but it's not just language, it's also culture. 
we have we share the same culture, the same values, the same political values. There isn't this deep split between Scotland and England uh, that suggests that the values of England and the values of Scotland or Wales are fundamentally different uh, from each other. And we're also all intermingled as people. I am a Scot, born in Edinburgh, brought up in Scotland, lived the first uh, vast majority of my years in Scotland. I'm living for family reasons in London at the moment, but my wife was English. My father was uh, Scottish, my mother was English. My two children were born in Scotland, uh, but they are both married to English wives. And my grandchildren would think of themselves as English because they live in the South of England. Now, are we really to say uh, that the, there is some sort of uh, fundamental issue which doesn't emerge from being Scottish or English, but which particular side of the border of a relatively small island, if you look at the world as a whole, uh, that that somehow should justify as uh, subdividing. And how would the world see it? You know, Britain, and I think I'm entitled to say this, and I challenge anyone who disagrees with me to give another example, which other country, which other major country in particular, but country, has for 300 years lived peacefully without internal war, without civil war. I don't mention Ireland, that's a different exact situation. Ireland was oppressed, Ireland was occupied by a foreign power and the Scots shared with the English the responsibility for that. But the Scots, the English and the Welsh have lived in peace and amity without violence, without civil war since 1707. You can't say that about the United States. You can't say it about France. You can't say it about Germany or Russia or any other country you care to mention. So what would it say to a world grappling with global problems if the United Kingdom, which has perhaps been the most successful country in the sense of not only having peacefully lived together for 300 years, but developed jointly democratic institutions and personal liberty and the rule of law, if the Scots and the English decided they had so little in common with each other that they had to break apart and form separate states. What a miserable conclusion that would come to, and how depressed it would make people, not just in Britain itself, but in the world as a whole. If, it, if Britain can't stay together, who, who on earth can stay together uh, in this fragmented uh, world? Now, that's the first reason why the nationalist argument is fundamentally flawed. There's a second reason as well, and it goes to the heart of the point we just made by the previous speaker. The nationalists, if they achieve their independence, have said explicitly Scotland should rejoin the European Union. So this isn't about a country wanting complete independence. If they succeed in that ambition, like any country in the European Union, the European Court of Justice will have the last word on many of their laws. That's the rules of the ECJ, of the European Union. The European Parliament will be able to override the wishes of Scottish members in determining what EU policy is. If a European foreign policy develops, which is what the European Union wants, Scotland will have to be part of that. If there's a single currency, there'll be pressure on Scotland to be part of that single currency. What else is the point of being in the European Union uh, if you're not going to ultimately join uh, the Euro as well? So what sort of independence are we actually talking about? Is the Scottish Nationalist Party saying, are nationalists arguing that we have so much in common with the continental Europeans, we're prepared to give up these items of our sovereignty, but we have so little in common with the people of England and Wales, that there are no issues, neither foreign policy nor defense nor the currency, which, which we can uh, allow a United Kingdom parliament to be part of the way uh, we are governed. So that's the second fallacy in the nationalist argument. And the third fallacy is this nonsense that because the opinion polls may have changed, I don't know whether that's certain. We, we all thought the opinion polls were gonna mean that the Remainers, of whom I was one, uh, would win the, the, the Brexit election uh, referendum. So opinion polls don't always get it right, but let's assume even if they are right. Opinion polls come and go. We're told by people who change their vote in Scotland because they don't like Boris Johnson, and they do like Nicola Sturgeon. Who can think of a lousier reason for breaking up the United Kingdom because you'd like Nicola Sturgeon or you don't like Boris Johnson? It's an absurd argument. And are we going to have referendums every few years until ultimately, if the nationalists are successful, they win one? You know what they said in Canada when they did this? They had several referendums. They said, it's not a referendum, it's a never ending. You keep having referendums till you win one, and then that's the last time the nationalists would allow a referendum. You think they would allow a referendum to come back into the United Kingdom? You must be joking if you believe that. Nobody believes that, and nobody should be expected to. So 
these are the fundamental flaws. But let's assume, let's assume, I don't think there should be another referendum, but I've made that obvious, I think. Let's assume that for whatever reason, at some stage, the pressure mounted and people decided, well, maybe we have to go and have another referendum. My view, and I hope it will be the government's view and Parliament's, Westminster's view, and the view of most people in Scotland, if we ever had to have another referendum on Scottish independence, it shouldn't happen until the SNP have said publicly and explicitly what their answer is to the three fundamental questions that they've never been able to answer either during the last referendum campaign or since. The first question is, what currency would an independent Scotland have? There's only three possibilities. It either has to have a Scottish pound, and we all know what happens if you create a brand new currency, and then the moment it comes into effect, its value plummets, particularly as North Sea oil has virtually disappeared. The second option is to join the Euro. Is that what they're going to do? They know they, they won't say that because they know the Euro is as unpopular in Scotland as it is in England. On that issue, the Scots and the English are pretty well of the same mind. The third possibility is you continue to have sterling, the pound. But of course, it's no longer the UK pound. It's become the English pound by then. What sort of independence is this? That you commit yourself to the currency of another country and therefore have your whole economic strategy controlled by that. So that's the first question. The nationalists should make up their mind and tell the people of Scotland before we have a referendum, before we even consider a referendum, which is it going to be? A Scottish pound? Is it going to be joining the euro? Is it going to be not having your own currency and being continuing with a currency determined in London? The second question they should have to answer is what actually would happen if they achieve their dreams? Scotland becomes independent and joins the European Union. What happens to the border between Scotland and England? Do you know what? It becomes a hard border because Scotland is part of the EU internal market and the rest of the United Kingdom isn't. Are we going to have a Scottish backstop, dare I use that phrase, in order to resolve this fundamental issue? And it's a serious issue. And as has been pointed out, 70% of Scottish trade goes to England and Wales and the rest of the United Kingdom. So is it going to be tariffs? Or is it somehow going to emerge a completely frictionless system? We haven't managed to get that between the United Kingdom and the EU. Why should, when Scotland joins the EU, should it be any different? That's the second thing they have to answer. What's going to happen at the border? And the third question, and it's already been touched on, is it, I'm not saying it is something I'm proud of. I'm a Scot. This so happens there is a huge deficit that the expenditure of the Scottish government, for whatever reason, is nine, there's a gap of 9% between what they spend and what they raise in Scotland. And that is paid by the United Kingdom taxpayer. And this, this is huge money. It actually adds up to 15 billion pounds a year, more than the whole cost of the Scottish health service. So if Scotland does become independent and oil's no longer around, we, nobody's seriously arguing, oil's gonna be able to fund that. It can only be funded in one of two ways, either by massive increases in the taxes the Scots would pay arising out of independence. And there is an alternative and that's cuts of 15 billion a year more than the total sum paid on the NHS in Scotland. So they, this is not a question of saying, could Scotland survive after? Of course, any country can survive. It's whether it would benefit economically from independence or whether it would not. And they have to answer these questions before we have a referendum, not when it's too late, after people thinking uh, they would hope for the best and pray for the best, but don't have answers on that point. Let me draw my remarks to a conclusion. I'm not one of those who argues that the alternative to independence or separatism, whatever you call it, has to be uh, the status quo. It could be the status quo, it's an option. Devolution is working reasonably well, but it's not, this is not just a Scottish issue. And I agree with what the speaker said, who said that you can't just argue this about economics. In this context, there is a comparison with Brexit. The people, the Remainers of whom I was one, thought they could win the Brexit argument on the economic benefits of being in the EU. And they didn't deal enough with the question of identity. And the issue in the relation to Scottish nationalism is not just Scotland. England also has an identity. The Welsh have an identity. The Northern Irish have an identity. 
And therefore, once you break up the United Kingdom, you're challenging that identity for all of us. Now, at the moment, I'm able to say, I'm a proud Brit and I'm a proud Scot. And I don't have to make that choice. And the same goes for people in England and Wales and Northern Ireland. The nationalists are trying to force that choice to be made. But I think it, there is a need to modernize the union because the union, what we call devolution, devolution was a, a concession by London handing decentralized powers to Scotland and then to Wales and already to Northern Ireland and then the regions of England all in a different way. But that's not what the union should be about in, a, in the modern world. Uh, we, we now all use the phrase, the four nations. It's become a very, it's not just about rugby internationals any longer. It's a recognition that the union is about the four nations, proud nations, but not just the Scots, the English and the Welsh and the Northern Irish in a different way, all have the same proud sense of identity. So I think we need to actually, if we ever had to have a referendum, which I don't want, but if we ever had to have one, uh, it can't just be a choice between the status quo uh, or uh, breaking up the union. There has to be a third option. You, some call it a federal system, some use other terms for it, but it's basically got to be the four nations agreeing uh, that what it still is sensible to do is for the United Kingdom government and parliament uh, to be responsible uh, for our armed forces, for our foreign affairs, for our defense policy, for the internal market crucial to our well-being on this island, to the currency which we will all ultimately sensibly wish to share. The same common head of state, obviously, and an uh, economic strategy of a general kind. These are the issues which should be for the United Kingdom, Parliament and government to decide, and not just Scotland, England and Wales and Northern Ireland, may not in the same way, but in different ways should identify the degree of home rule that they can have. Now, that is how you have a union which would meet the aspirations of the four nations, not just one nation or two, but all four. It would meet the aspirations of the nations, the four nations of the United Kingdom in a modern way and would allow the Scottish, but not just the Scottish, the English people as well, because don't take them for granted. Many people in England say, we're fed up with the Scots, we're fed up with the union, let's get rid of it. So there's an argument to be made, there's a case to be fought for the whole of the United Kingdom, uh, discovering a new union that meets our aspirations, that meets our sense of identity. And I simply end uh, with a splendid quote from Robert Burns. Some of you will have heard this quote, but I cannot resist using it. Uh, and because the nationalists like to think that Burns is somehow a great devotee of their nationalist cause. Well, in his address to the Dumfries volunteers, uh, Robert Burns wrote, and I quote part of the important part of the poem for this evening, oh, let us not in wrangling be divided, be Britain still to Britain true, among ourselves united, for never but by British hands must British wrongs be righted. So as a proud unionist, I quote Robert Burns as somebody who would undoubtedly have voted for this motion. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Sir Malcolm, for a wonderful and impassioned speech there. I'll now spend a, a chunk of the rest of the debate trying to find my own Robert Burns quotes to close this debate with, so as not to plagiarise you. I'd now like to ask uh, Mark Littlewood, who I believe is a former presidential candidate of the Oxford Union many years ago, to continue the case for the opposition. Well, Mr. President, um, thank you very much indeed. For, former candidate for the position of secretary, if I may correct you, Mr. President, I hate to correct you. I've never aspired to the lofty heights that you have now achieved, but uh, uh, you are correct. I have run in union elections. So, Mr. President, thank you for inviting me. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow speakers, uh, guests, uh, I'm an old fashioned sort of guy, but um, I'm someone who likes to keep abreast of current events. And Mr. President, I don't know if you've heard of this marvelous new fangled invention. It's called the internet. It's a, it's a truly amazing thing. You can keep up to speed with all sorts of things right across the globe. And there's this part of the internet, it's actually quite a big part, that's called Facebook. And on Facebook, you can check in on your friends and see how they're getting on in real time. So Mr. President, I may be an Englishman through a through, but I consider Scotland to be a very good friend. So I wanted to check in on Scotland on this newfangled Facebook thing. 
and I noticed that the Scotland Facebook page had apparently changed its relationship status from in a relationship to it's complicated. And boy, do I sympathise, Mr. President, because wow, the Scotland, the situation Scotland finds itself in is indeed complicated. Now, I know, Mr. President, that the motion addresses the Union of Great Britain and Northern Ireland as a whole. And obviously, Irish questions are even more complicated than the Schleswig Holstein question. Uh, you'll be aware that the Schleswig Holstein question was so complicated that Lord Palmerston said only three men in the world knew the answer to it. Uh, one who was dead, one who was mad, and the third was Lord Palmerston himself, and he, could forget, he confessed he'd forgotten it. Um, the Irish question is that complicated. The issue of possible Scottish independence is apparently complex, but less complex, I believe, than many make out, and it's also more immediate. So I'm going to uh, use what little time I have to consider Scotland's right to become an independent nation and its viability if it, were choose, if it were to choose to do so. So let's start with the right of the Scottish people or Scotland's largest political party to demand a second referendum. In 2014, the referendum, as we've already heard from previous speakers, was described as a once in a lifetime, a once in a generation opportunity. The question was to be settled for the very foreseeable future there and then. And like a previous speaker, I don't consider myself a great mathematician, but I would concede that seven years does not sound much like a lifetime or a generation. So is the matter closed? No, Mr. President, I'd advise that you had to read the small print, or in this case, the pretty stark, staring, obvious, in massive font, large print. A second referendum is wholly acceptable, perhaps even desirable, if the whole constitutional basis for that earlier decision has changed. And it has, clearly and unambiguously. If in 2014, as a Scottish voter, your overriding priority was to keep Scotland in the EU, you had to vote no to independence. Leaving the UK would automatically have meant, at that time, leaving the EU. Now, of course, the opposite applies. If you are very keen for Scotland to rejoin the EU, not an easy task, I concede, but neither a fanciful one, well, now you have to vote for Scotland to leave the United Kingdom. In the period between 2014 and today, Brexit has become a fact, and that changes everything. It's certainly an entirely reasonable basis for the Scots to be asked again about their future. This is especially the case, and I would underline this as a distinction between the Scottish referendum and the Brexit referendum. This is especially the case given the spectacular electoral results secured by the Scottish National Party in both Holyrood and Westminster elections since 2014. I'm conscious that one of my fellow speakers on this side had the statistically unusual misfortune of losing his seat to the Liberal Democrats. Uh, but the Liberal Democrats and Remain causes didn't make much progress. Uh, those calling for a second referendum over Brexit have not found uh, popular support amongst the people. Not true in Scotland. The Scottish National Party continues to perform spectacularly well. Uh, and having touched on the subject of Brexit, I think it behoves us all, but particularly Englishmen like me who voted for Brexit and to take back control, to show some even-handedness. Those of us who argued that the UK had the right to take back control from Brussels need to show the same generosity of spirit and to apply the same basic principle or, uh, to others, the basic principle of self-determination within our own union. Yet just last month, we heard uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson, a man who I'm usually pretty sympathetic to, but when he was talking about Scottish independence, he said, quote, I think endless talk about a referendum without any clear description of what the constitutional situation would be after the referendum is completely irrelevant. Oddly, he didn't seem to take the same view of the Brexit referendum in 2016. He was happy to lead the campaign to vote for leave and to work out the details over many months and years later. Uh, Malcolm Rifkin, Sir Malcolm Rifkin made the same point. Yes, there are huge issues about what currency Scotland should adopt. 
But it's not obvious to me that that couldn't be left until Scotland was independent. Uh, members of the Scottish National Party might very well disagree about those options on the table. It is a separate, and I would say subsequent, decision to whether you want to vote for independence or not. You might vote to stay in the union because you fear the answer, but you make the decision about whether you want to be independent first and how you're going to work out those issues later. They follow it. Uh, they are the cart uh, and independence itself is the horse. So I argue what's good for the English Brexit goose is surely good for the Scottish National Party gander. So I say Scotland has the right to decide again whether to secede from the union. But would it be wise for them to exercise that right, to actually pull that lever? Well, that is a matter for the Scots, not for me. But I think there can be no question that an independent Scotland is an entirely viable economic and political proposition. Of all of the questions raised about independence, the question of whether Scotland is big enough or rich enough to succeed in the world alone strikes me as the most ridiculous. In 2019, Scotland's GDP, its national income, uh, was about 250 billion US dollars. That is 44 billion more than New Zealand. It's about equal in size to the Czech Republic. It is 12 billion dollars more than Portugal, despite the fact that Portugal has almost twice the population of Scotland. It is 25 billion dollars more than Peru, a country that has six times larger the population, and Scotland's GDP is only marginally less than that of Finland, uh, who are also in the European Union. So the, the, the argument the economy is too small to function independently, I think, can be blown away, and that's doubly the case if you look at not just GDP, GDP per capita. Actually, Scotland's a pretty rich country. According to the Scottish Government, Scotland's GDP per person in 2019 was about 43,000 US dollars, slightly above that. That places Scotland in 18th position on the OECD list of GDP per capita. Its GDP per capita is the 29th highest in the world above nations such as, get this, Japan, Italy, New Zealand, Korea, the United Arab Emirates and Israel. Scotland's 5.4 million people would mean the country's population would be about equal with Norway, Slovakia, Denmark, or again, Finland, independent countries. And it, in fact, it does seem that for economic prosperity, as a general rule of thumb, small countries do tend to do better. As an example, if we look at the 12 richest countries in the world in terms of GDP per capita, all of them have a population of less than 9 million. Big might be impressive, but small is often the recipe for success. And this shouldn't surprise us. The closer decisions are made to the people, the better the chance you have of getting the policy right for your particular corner of the world. The policy mix that might work for Edinburgh and Aberdeen could be very, very different to that which works for Edgbaston or Aylesbury. And I'd say this about Scotland as well. It's not just about economics. Uh, I think that we need to recognise the contribution that Scotland has made to the world. Uh, I think that you can argue that no nation, certainly on a per capita basis, has contributed more to the modern world than Scotland. From Adam Smith's founding of modern economics, James Watt's refinement of the steam engine, Kirkpatrick Macmillan's creation of the pedal-driven bicycle, Alexander Fleming's messy laboratory that harbored penicillin, Alexander Graham Bell's telephone, Alex Ferguson's mastery of football tactics, not to mention probably the most successful children's author in history, J.K. Rowling. It's clear that much of the beauty and brilliance of the modern world exists thanks to the efforts and inspiration of Scots men and women. And sometimes we in England, I think, underestimate what Scotland has contributed to the world. And we're therefore pretty likely to underestimate its ability to operate independently and continue to contribute to the world going forward. It reminds me of the story of the amazing underrated dog. A dog walks into a butcher's shop on its own hind legs, no less. The dog walks confidently over to the counter. The butcher is amazed. He's even more amazed when the dog opens his mouth. Five pork chops, please, Governor, asks the dog. A stunned butcher, hastily packaged together five pork chops, wraps them up and passes them over the counter. Cheers, mate, says the dog, holding the package with his front paw. The dog then elegantly saunters out of the butcher's store. The butcher recovers his poise 
and feels he must find out more about this amazing dog, so follows him out of the shop. The dog waits by the bus stop, hails the driver, gets on the bus. The butcher follows him on, still in awe. After a short while, the dog rings the bell, thanks the driver, walks off the bus. Again, the butcher follows him. A short way up a residential road, the dog opens the garden gate, walks up the pathway to the front door, knocks on the front door. Gary, Gary, I'm home. I've got your pork chops for you. Managed to get them at a discount too. The dog knocks again. Gary, Gary, I'm back. I've got your meat. And again, Gary, Gary, let me in. Eventually, the door opens. Gary, a huge man, is bearing a stick. To the butcher's horror, he whacks the poor dog with it three times while shouting, you idiot, stupid, cretinous dog. The butcher can't believe it. You can't do that. You can't say that. That dog is a genius. Genius, my ass, replies Gary. That's the second time this week he's forgotten his keys. Now, let's not treat Scotland as the owner treated his amazing dog. If the dog can stand on its own hind legs, Scotland can, if it chooses, assuredly stand on its own two feet. Mr. President, this union doesn't need to save the larger union. It shouldn't try. Instead, it needs to set the people free, confident that the people themselves have the wit, the wisdom, and the good sense to choose their own destiny. I urge you to oppose the motion. Mark, thank you very much indeed. Of all the, the long jokes you told me at the pub before, that was one of the best. And I normally take this opportunity to make some kind of snarky comment, but I would just like to take the moment to say thank you to you for all the support and help you've given me in my career over the years. So thank you very much for this speech as well. And now to carry on the case for the proposition, I'd like to ask Baroness Stewart. My lady, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, as a German, I won't uh, even attempt to be humorous. Uh, it never kind of works. Um, but I have to say, I've been listening to this debate so far and I'm beginning to wonder whether I joined the wrong debate. I mean, did, did I miss the point of this? I mean, I do know that the closest shark to the boat at the moment seems to be uh, Scotland, uh, but I thought this is a slightly wider debate. It's about the unions. So, let me take the Bavarian position uh, and talk about unions first. And uh, because some unions survive, others break up, others are talked about and never happen, and others adapt and continue to be successful. So let's look at a union which survived. Bavaria, my place of birth, uh, population of about 10 and a half million. Uh, the leading uh, party, the CSU, is the sister party of the current governing party. Uh, it never had the same political party as in, in, in terms of, of uh, the rest of Germany. Bavaria never even signed the uh, basic laws in 1948, but because it's a federal state, uh, it was bound by them. Um, it joined the, the Prussian German Union in 1871. It has been a net contributor to, to the Federal Republic ever since inception. But you know what? There have been occasional rumblings of independence, but it has always been since 1871 when Bavaria, the kingdom, had the choice to join Prussia, Germany or Austria, it chose Prussia, Prussia Germany and was content. Now, then look at unions which break up. You have some very significant unions historically on mainland Europe and probably the most significant one would be the Austro-Hungarian one, uh, which was immensely powerful. Uh, it dissolved in 1918, uh, following World War I. And then you've got some unions, and this is something that we, we tend to forget, which are often talked about, but for some reason or another, simply don't happen. Now, I'm quoting Robert Toombs uh, quite deliberately because I, I I sort of just like to sort of needle the Oxford Union by quoting a Cambridge historian. You know, I think it's pretty low, but you know, hey, let's do it anyway. Uh, Robert Toombs in The Sovereign Isles uh, talks about the, the very special relationship with France. And he reminds us of the fact that France is the only country since 1066 with which England or Britain has three times considered a formal union. In the, in the 1420s, in 1940, and in 1956. Of course, in 1966, Charles de Gaulle 
firmly refused the, the United Kingdom to join the then common market. And you could almost argue that the closest the, the Britain and France got to union was when we joined in 1973 and then thought better of it in 2016. And uh, quite rightly, uh, Rachel challenged me at the outset that I'm selective about unions. Yes, I'm selective about unions because some unions serve a purpose and deserve to adapt and change and, and be maintained and others uh, simply may have outlived their purpose. So let me look at what the what successful unions have achieved. And this particular union, I would say, is a successful one. And again, continuing my, my, my preference for Cambridge, uh, Robert Toombs in this Oxford debate, uh, he starts his book on the sovereign isles with a very simple statement, which is, his geography comes before history. So the one thing which these isles cannot ignore is their geography. And with that become certain historical developments. And when I say that this union served us well, I use the word us very deliberately because this is our union. It doesn't belong to any one component. And therefore, when uh, Mark Littlewood talked about the Scottish people have a right to be asked again. Well, maybe the United Kingdom Union people may also have a right to be asked again. This is not a, a, uh, a just one parts decision. And let's just look at what this our union has over 300 years de collectively delivered. And let's examine whether for the component parts a separation from that union would deliver anything worth having. But I'm, I'm the first one to say that the union as it stands needs to adapt. So let's just look at the key components which hold the union together. It is the most significant elements of statehood which we share, which is the monarch, its crown in parliament, it is a currency, and it is an army. That's what you start off with. A, 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 a state raises taxes in order to have an army. But then of course, uh, we, we have to share the prosperity and we have to have a common demos. And I would argue that we have taken this union for granted for too long. We haven't thought about it. We haven't articulated it. In the last 40 years, we've had a continued use of referendums. It started, we know whether it's Wales, it was Scotland, it was Northern Ireland. We devolved power to uh, London. And we've kind of overlooked England and what it means taking the powers of decision making to the lowest, most appropriate level. And we have treated the union for too long as being a monetary transactional relationship. Uh, and I was again was struck by uh, Mark Littlewood's, uh, Littlewood's uh, voting of GDP and uh, but just a little whisper, the Barnett formula. Yeah, but don't mention it, you know. Uh, so, so, so some of those calculations uh, may need revisiting, but similar arguments, by the way, apply to if you're in the West Midlands or whether in London or whether in parts of England. And when we talk about devolution, I would also challenge, and that's probably a debate for another day, whether having devolved power to uh, Cardiff and Edinburgh, whether Cardiff and Edinburgh then have really devolved power to the most appropriate levels as they should have, or whether it's just been a shifting of power. And that's bad for democracy as well. So England, I think, is probably in this whole debate, the real elephant in the room. Uh, this articulation of England having taken the union for granted, England, having, England not having sufficiently acknowledged that it too benefits significantly from the contributions of Northern Ireland, of Wales and of Scotland particularly when I look at areas of defense, incredibly significant. So what do I think are the, the, the big things which make us stronger uh, and, and where the union has benefited all of us? The first one would be the people and, and Malcolm Rifkin made a, a very powerful point for that. But you know, we share an island, we travel between the nations and we have families and friends and we have colleagues across the country and over the border. 
we celebrate a union of 300 years of that shared history and probably bring a lot of our qualities together, institutions which we've shaped. Uh, and if, if, if at the moment, if there is one thing, which if you want a real illustration of how the United Kingdom Union has, has delivered for the people of this union, albeit in different differentiated ways, it would be the procurement of vaccines. It's the rollout of vaccines. And I would challenge the SNP colleagues on this call of during the pandemic, what would they have done differently? What would they have done which they could not do now if they had been independent? However, we've all benefited from the vaccine and we've all benefited from the furlough schemes. We are stronger collectively, whether it's our representation in the world, whether it is uh, facing global challenges in terms of the environment, whether it's cybersecurity, all those things make a case for the union. But I do accept that there is some challenges in terms of uh, addressing local problems, which by the way, whether it's our high streets, whether delivering our schools, may be the same as whether in Aberystwyth with Aberdeen or in Newry or in Newquay. But if I believe in unions, and if I believe that unions have to adapt and change and reflect changing circumstances, then I think this union has some challenges which it has to face, which go beyond the voice of England. Um, and I would say the voice of England outside London, because we've got big devolutions in London. I think we need institutions where the four component parts show due respect to each other. We need to find intergovernmental institutions within that union, which are a forum for seeking consensus in finding joint solutions, not one of simply creating ever more grievances. And I think England in particular probably will have to show some more respect. However, this is a union I support and it is our union. And that takes me to the core of why those who challenge me and saying, isn't it rather strange, dear Gisela Stewart, that in 2016 you argued to leave one union and now in 2021 you're defending another union. What's the difference? Well, I think the biggest difference is the existence of a demos. And a demos means that we share a wealth and we invest the power to choose and to dismiss a government and its policies in our people. That is the difference between this union and the European Union. This our union is a good one. It has proved itself to be good for, for over 300 years. If we reform it, it will go on to continue to do so. But above all, together we are stronger, we are more resilient, and we are forced for good, not just on these isles, but we are forced for good globally. Gisela, thank you very much indeed. And to show that there's no hard feelings between that other union over in Cambridge, Robert Toombs will actually be speaking in the last debate of term in two weeks' time on whether this house is a roundhead or a cavalier. And I hope everyone can come and join us for that as well. But thank you very much for your speech. Now, to continue the case for the opposition, I'd like to ask Alan Smith, MP. Alan, thank you very much indeed. Mr. President, uh, thanks uh, very much indeed for the invitation. Uh, thank you to fellow speakers and uh, everyone participating. I'm delighted uh, to be here, sadly virtually, but uh, perhaps we'll in better times be able to manage uh, a physical meeting because Scotland's going to be an interesting place for a long time yet, I suspect, and politics in these islands is, I suspect, not quite in its final settled state. So I'm delighted to be here to give my perspective. And when I say perspective, I don't mean another word for opinion. I've been really struck since I got to Westminster in 2019 that we see in Scotland these debates and current events from a different place. We don't have a different view but just because we have a different mindset. We have a different perspective and a different vista that we're thinking through. And I think there's increasing evidence that we see Scotland and England are objectively different places with a different sense of themselves, a different sense of their place in the world, a different sense of their ambitions for their future, and a different sense of what that best future might be. So I would not save the union. But in so doing, I would uh, urge people to oppose the proposition, but in so doing, I gently suggest that even the framing of it proves my point. Seen from Scotland, there's not just one union that's relevant to us, there's two. 
There's the union that uh, was created with uh, England and Wales by Treaty of Union, which of course was implemented by Acts of Union, but was Treaty of Sovereign States with England and Wales to form Great Britain in 1707, and then was endorsed for the first time ever by the people of Scotland in 2014, with 55% of the vote. Or the European Union, which we've just been forcibly removed from against our democratic will, and a project that is causing visible harm and visible hurt and measurable economic impacts and societal damage to our countries right now. So I believe it's the interplay of the 2014 and the 2016 referendums that have vastly increased the potency of our argument that Scotland's best future is independence in Europe. Now, it's worth me saying tonight, I'm a friend of England. I was at Leeds University. I consider myself an honorary Yorkshireman. I uh, was at Nottingham Law School. I was a solicitor in London for many years, very happily. And I appreciate deeply that many people in England, Scotland too, have a deep, genuine, sentimental attachment to the union with the UK. And I respect that. And I have to say, and, and I'd apologize for right now that in 2014, I think we should have been more gentle with that psychology, because I think there was a sense in Scotland that this is a debate for us and nobody else. I, I think we need to make sure we do not make that mistake in the future. And I'm very firm in my view as lead foreign affairs for the SNP at Westminster, that we must ensure there are no surprises for our international neighbors and friends in our debate, it does have consequences for other people. So we need to make sure that that does not have any surprises going forward. But I'm also equally sure that the people best placed to make decisions for Scotland are the people of Scotland. The people best placed to decide what's in our best future is the people of Scotland. And the position of the UK government right now that uh, now is not the time for a referendum, the settled will was expressed in 2014 and nothing's changed since, is utterly unsustainable, and especially in Scotland, just not a serious proposition. Things have objectively changed since 2014. So we've got a tale of two referendums, which will result for the people of Scotland in a choice of two unions. Now in 2014, our, the, the psychology of Scotland shifted from could we be independent to should we be independent? Because during the 2014 campaign, the numbers, the economic case, uh, the, the reality of Scotland's economic situation was thoroughly ventilated and thoroughly interrogated. And as we've heard previously, Scotland clearly has what it takes to be a successful economic performer in the world stage. We've got resources other countries would give their eye teeth for. We've got a geographic position that is uh, advantageous for all sorts of reasons. We've got a lot of assets going. So a lot of people shifted from could we to should we. The question was, would it actually be the best thing? And for, by 55%, the people of Scotland decided, no, it was not worth the, the change. It was not worth the risk. The advantages were not seen. But it would be really important to, to note that of that 55%, somewhere, but most, are not actually hostile to independence. There was two unions that were tested and the need for change was not made. Our proposition from the, the SNP, from the yes side, was essentially that uh, what you have, you'll keep. The UK and Scotland will, going forward, remain part of the customs union, the single market, and the European Union. We'll move to Scotland would move to a new status within that matrix, and we would be uh, working forward on that basis. On the other side, we were promised continued EU membership. We were promised we were a partnership of equals. We were told to lead, not leave. We were promised more powers for the Scottish Parliament, as we've heard tonight, even, to, even six years later. We were promised more powers for the Scottish Parliament, as close to federalism as it's possible to get. There was the promise. And 55% were not persuaded of the need for change. 45% were. And to achieve that result after 300 years of an incorporating union is a miraculous level of self-confidence and respect that the people of Scotland have. So where 55% of the population was not hostile to independence but didn't feel the need to endorse it, then came 2016. Now for an English audience, for the English electorate, 2016, the EU referendum was a standalone event. In Scotland, it really wasn't. In Scotland, it was coloured by the independence referendum just 18 months before, and the promises that were made in that referendum on both sides, very sharply in the, the minds of the people of Scotland. So what we saw was that where we had been promised federalism, the Smith Commission in reality delivered nothing like it. We were promised EU membership, gone. We were promised we were a partnership of equals. But then within dits, we saw English votes for English laws and we were told we were part of the United Kingdom, not a partner in it. 
that will have been news to many of the people who endorsed the UK for the first time in 2014. So there's a legitimate view for some people to say that Scotland is part of the UK rather than a partner in it, but it wasn't what was promised. And since 2016, we've had three democratic events in Scotland where my party has been massively endorsed by the people of Scotland. The 2017 Westminster election, the 2019 European election, the 2019 Westminster election again, where time and again, the reality of the democratic deficit of the United Kingdom has been made very clear to the people of Scotland. And the United Kingdom government has at every turn taken the opportunity to endorse the hardest sort of Brexit despite our efforts to the contrary. The reality of the democratic deficit is utterly unsustainable and treating Scotland with disdain a mere matter of months after the promises that were made in 2014 is arguably why we've got to where we are within this public sentiment within Scotland. And even while it's not my project, I've tried to make the best of Brexit, but you can't make the good of a bad job. We were told for the fishermen there was a sea of opportunity, but instead we've seen fish and fish products rotting at the quayside. We've seen EU nationals treated appallingly. EU nationals are new Scots in Scotland, and they've been made to feel unwelcome. They've been made to feel not part of our community. And I'm deeply proud that the Scottish Parliament has legislated to open the voting franchise to all people based on residence rather than nationality. We've got a different way of doing things in Scotland, and that's becoming clearer and clearer to the people of Scotland that we could do better than we've seen. And the loss of the Erasmus programme, a grievous, willful act of vindictiveness on a cultural, societal and educational level against the next generation, your generation, which only became clear at the very last minute of the negotiations. Scotland could do better than we've got. So we've seen a number of negative consequences of Brexit to us as a society and as an economy. All of these things would get back with independence. As I, as I clearly say, I don't think Scotland has a right to tell England to remain in the European Union. So why the hell is it the other way round? The people of Scotland endorsed the Union in 2014 on the basis of a series of specific promises which have been betrayed, in large part, by the subsequent actions of the UK government. The democratic deficit of the United Kingdom is entirely unsustainable. A union, and Scotland's been independent for an awful lot more of our history than part of Great Britain, a union can only be maintained if there is consent and respect. By our democratic actions in Scotland, it's clear the people of Scotland did not consent to Brexit and all its real world implications, but it happened anyway. There are a number of things that we have not consented to. And so Scotland will soon have a choice, a choice between two unions. We'll have the reality of Brexit Britain and its democratic deficit, negative economic consequences and narrower, meaner horizons. And that for the first time in Ireland's history, the upper hand against the former colonial power in the Brexit negotiations. Scotland can win that with independence. Uh, that we can have truly the best of both worlds. All of the social stuff, I'll still be an honorary Yorkshireman, an English qualified lawyer, all of the social stuff we'll keep, we maintain, we'll be a great neighbor, but we'll regain the real world day-to-day -day advantages for our economy, for our society, with independence in Europe. I believe that that's our best future. I believe that that's actually good news for the UK as well, and that we'll be able to form plot a different path while being close friends and close neighbours. Time passes, things change. The European political map of the continent has changed, and it's not stopped changing. 2014 wasn't a fixed point in the compass. The future is unwritten. And the people best placed to make the choices for the future of Scotland are the people of Scotland. I believe that the utility of the union with England has been supplanted and surpassed by a bigger, more modern, more functioning union with our European continent. So I'd urge colleagues to, to oppose the resolution before us this evening. Thank you. Alan, thank you very much for that. And thank you for battling through a couple of um, internet signal issues. I noticed they only came up when you said that you're an honorary Yorkshireman, so I can only blame it on the Lancastrians. And now to close the case for the proposition, I'd like to ask Douglas Alexander for his speech. Douglas, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. President. In speaking to the proposition that the union would save the union, let me start my remarks this evening with both an admission and a declaration of interest. For me, the issues we are discussing this evening are not dry constitutional arrangements or even an interesting theoretical debate. On the contrary, these issues for me run deep and indeed touch on a deep sense of affinity and belonging. I am proudly 
passionately, extravagantly Scottish. I was born in Scotland, educated in Scottish schools and at a Scottish university. I qualified in Scots law. I'm a communicant member of the Church of Scotland. Every one of those experiences have shaped me and crafted the lens through which I gain my perspective and see the world. My politics, and indeed all politics, begins and ends with relationships, with our neighbour, with our family, with our community, with those who lead us and make decisions for us. Politics is shaped by our story, our history, our aspirations. So for me, constitutional politics involves much, much more than a ledger of accounts. It speaks to who we are, how we see ourselves, and how we relate to each other. It's about a common journey, indeed a shared story. And part of my story is not just that I'm Scottish, but that I'm Labour. So tonight, I want to make the positive progressive case for Scotland, remaining a partner in the United Kingdom, not despite of, but because I am Labour. As the membership card in my pocket puts it, the Labour Party believes that by the strength of our common endeavour, we achieve more than we can alone. My creed is solidarity and sharing, cooperation, not separation. And while some argue that what we share is not always well used, that critique does not stop it being, for me, a sign of something good, a sign of something progressive in our partnership of nations, that wealth, risks and rewards are better shared with our neighbours. So tonight, I do not seek to make the case for an old idea of the union, based on timeless deference to institutions like the monarchy, the army or parliament. Because I believe the United Kingdom, this oldest of political unions, still embodies a quintessentially modern idea, one I like and believe in, that diversity can be a strength rather than a weakness. I like the idea that on these small rainy islands in the North Atlantic, we share risks and rewards in a genuinely multicultural, multi-ethnic and multinational union, a shared space of ideas, of identities, of industries and ideals. Despite the challenges that we face as a country, and my goodness, they are real, I continue to believe that across Britain, we gain from common services and shared strength, made all the more evident, as we've already heard this evening, in the wake of the shared crisis of the pandemic or the future challenges of climate change. Now, of course, in recent years, we've seen the rise of nationalism and populism right across the Western world. And here in Britain, Millions of us, both north and south of the border, have been, if you like, squeezed between two nationalist narratives, which in the last decade of division delivered first a referendum in Scotland in 2014, and then the Brexit referendum in 2016. Whether it is directed against London, as in the case of Scottish nationalism, or directed against Brussels, as was the case with British nationalism, nationalism always involves redrawing the boundaries of empathy and asserting a sense of us by constantly differentiating us from them. I voted and campaigned both for Scotland to remain in the United Kingdom and for the United Kingdom to remain in the European Union. So I understand that I share the deep disappointment felt by so many of my fellow Scots at that Brexit result. But the best response, I believe, to a politics of flag-waving division and new borders is not more flag-waving, more division and more borders. Brexit, I believe, should serve as a warning to be heeded, not a model to be followed. Scotland's First Minister has stated, there is no rational case for taking the UK out of the single market, a point at least on which I agree with her. She also stated that leaving the EU single market would be disastrous and potentially ruinous for Scotland's economy. And yet last year, Scotland did indeed export goods and services worth around 2.9 billion pounds to France, our largest EU trading partner. Yet the inconvenient truth for the Scottish nationalists is that Scotland exports 51.2 billion pounds worth of goods and services to the rest of the United Kingdom, compared to just 16.1 billion to European Union countries. If it is bad for Scotland to leave the EU single market, as we've just heard, 
which receive around 19% of our exports, it would be disastrous for Scotland to leave the UK single market, where we send 60% of our exports. Indeed, a report produced by LSE only this month confirms that changes in trade costs due to independence would be actually two or three times more costly for the Scottish economy than the cumulative impact of Brexit. Having witnessed one form of nationalism take us out of Europe with very little thought for the consequences, I would argue we should be wary of another form of nationalism repeating a similar mistake in Scotland. But the nationalists, let's be honest, they have an a priori commitment to independence. It's not really about Brexit. It's a politics where the facts are fluid because the cause is constant. If the economy is doing well, then that's an argument for independence. If the economy is doing badly, well, that's an argument for independence as well. If unemployment is low, that's an argument for independence. If the economy is doing badly and, and unemployment is high, that's an argument for independence. If there's even a once in a century pandemic, that's somehow purloined as an argument for independence. The nationalist songs may be slightly different, but they always have the same chorus. In a nationalist worldview, with a nationalist perspective, independence trumps everything and faith trumps facts. But the fact remains that separation is not in the best interests, either of Scotland or I would argue of the United Kingdom. And the argument this evening therefore is not between change and the status quo, as some have suggested. Let me be very clear, supporting the motion this evening does not require you to support Boris Johnson's government. Indeed, I unequivocally condemn its lethal incompetence and callous indifference. But Boris Johnson and the Conservatives are no more Britain than Nicola Sturgeon and the SNP are Scotland. My Britain is the Britain of Burns, a man's a man, and Blake's Jerusalem, a Britain of the BBC and of the National Health Service. And in the last century, we fought together to defeat fascism and then worked together to build a welfare state. Just last year, we stood on our doorsteps together from the inner cities to the outer Hebrides and clapped for carers and our frontline workers in every part of the United Kingdom. Each and every day, our National Health Service and our British Armed Forces are working in every part of the United Kingdom to defeat this deadly pandemic and keep every one of us safe. Surely the deeper lesson of this crisis is that what really matters is not our independence, but our interdependence. And yes, our country does need to change, to reform and renew across these islands. But we do not need to be separate countries to create a fairer and more inclusive future. Instead of a narrow nationalism which seeks to divide us, we can demonstrate that our future lies in empathy across nations and between nations, rather than a future of enmity and division. So the real progressive choice for the coming years is this, is to build up the National Health Service, not to break up our country, to end poverty, not to end Britain. It is to work together and not simply to walk away from our neighbours. I urge this union to support the motion. Not only can we save the union, I believe it is a progressive choice to do exactly that. Douglas, thank you very much indeed for closing the case with the proposition. I must say I find the idea of being extravagantly Scottish a wonderful bit of imagery, so thank you very much. And now to close the debate, it's a totality and to close the case for the opposition, I'd like to ask Stephen Gethin's speech. Thank you very much. And, uh, thank you and thanks very much for having us along tonight. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be along um, to Oxford Union for this debate tonight, for me to, to speak again. I'm so sorry we can't do it in person. Um, a fine place to debate. It's maybe not quite as good as St Andrews, but a fine place nevertheless. Not bad or no bad, as I might say in Scotland. And thanks to my colleagues um, and, and friends from both sides for contributing to this debate tonight. Um, I'm going to touch upon some of the points in a moment, but I've been asked on a number of occasions, how on earth did you manage to lose the Liberal Democrats? Well, I thought I'd better tackle that one head on, first of all. Both Douglas and I know what it's like to lose an election. It's not pleasant, but it happens sometimes. And whereas the vote went up quite considerably, 
Unfortunately, I made the fatal error of telling the voters what I thought about a wide range of issues, giving the Liberal Democrats an in. Um, but what I think is important on that issue about what we think is understanding each other. And my colleague Alan Smith rightly pointed out the different perspectives that are emerging. And sometimes when I read the media from elsewhere in the United Kingdom, I see so much misinformation about what's going on in Scotland at the moment. And so I'm grateful to Oxford Union tonight for giving us this opportunity. And I'm grateful to my friends and colleagues from both sides for putting across their perspectives as well. I think it's an important thing to do. But we see the, the, the misinformation, be it on vaccine rollout and the different approaches that have been taken. I was hearing earlier in one of the papers about a one-party state in Scotland. Well, it must be the only one-party state in the world that has a proportional representation electoral system and regular elections on a five-year basis. So if it is a one-party state, we're clearly not doing it very well. And a set of circumstances whereby the legal system in Scotland is attacked and the Faculty of Advocates and the Law Society of Scotland find themselves having to go out to defend the independence of that. But what we have seen, and one thing that Alan touched upon, is a divergence in the way that people see the way the country is run and the politics between London and Edinburgh. We see a divergence, which, has, which means that people increasingly look to the Scottish government and trust the Scottish government. We see a divergence in a hundred point gap in the approval ratings between Nicola Sturgeon and Boris Johnson in Scotland. We see a divergence, and I've heard a lot of people talk about nationalisms and they'll do this and they'll do that. I always say if any politician, trust them by their actions. Don't trust them by, the, by, by what other people say about them. And there's a divergence there in terms of an immigration system that we want to be more open. We want to see more new Scots, as Alan pointed out, coming to Scotland. We want to maintain that freedom of movement. We want to tackle inequality. We didn't need Marcus Rashford to come and tell us that kids who were hungry and in poverty needed free school meals during the holidays. We also want to see more action on issues like climate change. And fundamentally, this is about our place in the world. But my appeal to our friends from elsewhere in the United Kingdom, and I've heard an awful lot of emotional appeal. I'm somebody who loves England. I'm very fortunate to be married to a woman from England and adore my time in Kent, and I love my time working in London, is that what has happened when you have to get into an age group, you have to be in your 60s before you even find a slim majority of people in favour of the union, where increasingly your citizens do not identify with the state in which they're in and want to see a way forward. When on polls that have come out tonight, you already see people, 44% will vote on the basis of independence at the forthcoming Scottish parliamentary elections. And I think our friends elsewhere forget this is a multinational state. The clue's in the name. It is the United Kingdom. It is a union. And Malcolm pointed out that it is um, four separate nations. Some people in Northern Ireland might quibble with that, but there are all these distinctive entities. And Gisela Stewart talked about the idea of demos, the idea of voting for the government you get. We don't get the governments we vote for in Scotland. And that's a fundamental breach of that democratic trust. And it's why people are increasingly turning away. You've also got a set of circumstances in the UK compared to the European Union, whereby in the European Union, you have an arbitration system. You're not forced into decisions. You agree to the treaty changes that are made. Whereas in the United Kingdom, we have a set of circumstances, an abomination of the House of Lords, which will have a greater say on the internal market bill, for instance, which will have greater centralisation and will bring greater powers back to Westminster, who have more of a say in that bloated 800 member House of Lords than the Scottish Parliament will. So let's not forget the set of circumstances in which we've been left in when the House of Lords has a greater say on Scotland's future than its directly elected government. And that's meant that this idea of a once in a generation I've heard. Well, Alex Hammond rightly said, well, he thinks it's a once in a generation, but that changes with political events. And the SNP did something, did something unusual in UK politics, which is they said, we're going to put in a manifesto commitment, which will say that if there is a change in circumstances, such as Scotland being taken out of the EU against its will, we should have an independence referendum. And they won an election on that. And they won three subsequent elections on that manifesto commitment as well. And I'm saddened by Brexit, but I've said this to friends and I say this to those who are here tonight. 
The UK is changing rapidly. The UK that left the EU is not the same UK that joined. And it's changing rapidly. And the UK that emerges, it goes into the general election in 2024. And I think Douglas is being very optimistic if he thinks his party's in with a chance um, at those elections. It's going to be a fundamentally different United Kingdom, a fundamentally different union than the one we see today. It's one that is more, um, more centralised. It's ones that Scots do not find a, find a part in. And that has real consequences. It's real consequences that we are already seeing. And Alan was right to point out the job losses that are taking place. But I'm somebody who went into politics and firmly believe that we should leave more opportunities for the generations that come after us than we ourselves had. But the UK's decision to take out training opportunities and educational opportunities in Erasmus, narrowing down the opportunities, reintroducing a Turing scheme instead that doesn't even have um, an exchange um, level in it, tells us the direction in which we are going. And it's a, dilect, a direction of increased isolationism where the UK government will not even give diplomatic status to the EU ambassador being the only country on earth not to do that. The last country to have done that was the Trump government and they changed their mind after six weeks. This is a country that is isolated. It is a country that is going in a direction that nobody else agrees with. And that saddens me. That saddens me enormously. But I want to look forward. Independence, I believe, would be good for England. It would force us to reassess our relationship. Scotland would thrive as a part of the European Union. I believe Scotland would bring England and Wales closer to Europe, just as Ireland has done as a friend to the United Kingdom. And Douglas talked about exports. Well, Ireland continues to export the same to the UK, but it's grown its exports and grown its relationship with the rest of the European Union. And Scotland is now surrounded by countries who are doing better than it economically, but are the similar sizes. Countries like Ireland, Iceland, Finland, Norway, Denmark, the Netherlands. And I'll leave you with this thought. I've heard all these speakers on the other side talk about the impossibility of change, that we shouldn't change no matter what the circumstances. We must change. And I'll look at this. In Norway, Finland, Sweden, Greenland, the Faroe Islands, some of those entities are autonomous, some of them are independent. Some of those entities sit in the European Union, some sit outside. But in terms of identity, for example, they can feel Nordic or Scandinavian or Norwegian or Swedish and European as well. And that's brought those countries closer together as a partnership of equals, because that's what the EU delivers. And I think that will deliver a more positive relationship for everybody in these islands in the future. And Mr. President, thank you for giving us the opportunity tonight. I hugely appreciate it. Stephen, thank you very much and thank you for coming as well. And thank you to all of our speakers this evening um, on both sides of the debate. I'm now going to put up the option for people to vote on how they think. And it falls to me now to do a little bit of uh, filler to give people the opportunity to vote for just a little minute. But the first thing I can do is to say that the first poll after our first two speakers was that 60% of people would save the union and 40% of people wouldn't. So we'll give people just another minute on here to see how they would vote and we'll close it. And, and normally as the term has gone on, I keep threatening limericks at people um, to, to fill this time. And of course, not many of them I can actually probably share, but I think that since uh, Sir Malcolm shared a, a quote from Burns, I think my favorite is that, uh, what is it? That, but pleasures are like poppies spread. You pluck the flower, its bloom is shed. Or as the snow falls in the river, a moment white then lost forever. And hopefully that's enough filling time for the, the, my elves in the background to be able to, uh, to get the right tabulation of results. Um, and I can say that at the end of the debate, we've gone from 60-40 to 63% of people would save the union and 37% of people wouldn't. And thank you very much to everybody for this. I'm sure, as has been said by Alan, this is a debate that will go on and that politics, both in this union and the wider union, will continue to be exciting for a long time to come. And with that, I remain James Price, Worcester College, and your president. Thank you.